and to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. Jesus wrote an epistle, a little letter here. We're going to read it today to a church in Smyrna. Now, usually, you know, he writes these letters, there's seven of them. He usually writes to the church of a particular town. He doesn't do that here. This is to a, a, the church in Smyrna. They understood what he meant, do you? Because Smyrna means, uh, it's literally the word myrrh. It's hard for us to comprehend the word myrrh. We tend to think it's just a weird old-fashioned thing that wise men gave to Jesus when he was born, but... The Bible says in John chapter 19 that myrrh, it was a customary spice to be put upon bodies that are dead. Kind of like when you hear, dun, 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 we think, oh, it's a funeral dirge. We think it's an old song for a funeral. They had that same association with myrrh. When they hear the word myrrh, they think of how, like when Jesus died on the cross, uh, they put a hundred pounds of myrrh up and, and wrapped it in linen, covered it in linen, put it on his body. Myrrh was a picture of, a reminder of death. Jesus was dying on the cross. Some, after they tortured him and ridiculed him and mocked him, some wise guy thought it would be a real gas to offer him a sponge with wine and myrrh in it. Kind of like saying, hey, you're going to die real soon. Here's some myrrh to remind you. To the people in Jesus' time, myrrh was just a reminder of we're all dying. We're all going to die. Suffering. And yet Jesus wrote a a letter to the church in suffering. That's important. Because we live in a time when, you know, if you write, if you build, if you start a new church, you know, you think about the, the church Uh, environment nowadays a lot of the big prominent churches that we hear about on the national scene they're called things like vertical church elevation church highlands church we're going somewhere baby this is a church for people who are awesome and everything's great all the time and the problem is uh, that's that whole feeling is exactly why so many of us get so depressed at christmas because there's an idea that this is a time for awesomeness. This is where everything's going to be great. Isn't everyone who's a good believer having good times? Isn't that what we tend to think? And yet when the lights go down, the, the music turns off, we realize that we too hurt. And we think there must be something wrong because we hurt. But actually Jesus reminds us when he writes us a letter to the church, the Christians in suffering, that there's sometimes something very right about being a Christian who suffers. And today, um, if you happen to be in a season of suffering, oh, I'm so glad you're here. But some of us who aren't in a season of suffering right now, it's good that we be here as well. Because hold your breath, just a little while, you too will suffer. It's just part of our life. Jesus said, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So we have this promise that a day of suffering comes if we follow Jesus. And and in this passage, he's going to show us that the, the part that is right in suffering. Heavenly Father, we pray you comfort our hearts who suffer today. And Lord, those of us who will one day soon suffer, Get them prepared for it. Lord, that we might find your fingerprints even in our heart, on our hearts when they're bleeding. In your son's name we pray. Amen. So let's dive on in. Let's read the whole letter, if, if, you, if you wouldn't mind. Can we read the whole letter together as a church family? Beginning in verse um, 8, he says, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. Verse 9, I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things 
which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. This is Jesus' letter to the church in suffering, the church in myrrh, covered in a hundred pounds of myrrh to cover the smell of stench. His word to the suffering had no correction. That's the first thing I want to point out to you. You know, in almost all of these letters that Jesus writes to the churches, he has correction. Don't you know that in your life, in all of our lives, at any time, there's a lot of correction that could be said. And yet, Jesus did, he spared them the correction here. Jesus does what you and I must. You see, what we tend to do when we see people who are afflicted is we tend to afflict them all the more. Jesus, when he sees the comfortable, he afflicts them. Remember the the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, oh, I've done all the commandments my whole life. What must I do to enter into the kingdom of heaven? Jesus saw this guy was pretty comfortable with who he is and all that he's become. And Jesus kind of afflicted the comfortable, didn't he? He said, "Um, uh, well, this you haven't done. Why don't you sell everything you have and give it to the poor? Jesus afflicted the comfortable. But when he sees the afflicted, he comforts them. Jesus sees a church in suffering and he gives them no correction at all. That's not because they're perfect, but it's because Jesus knows what to do with our suffering hearts. No one knows the suffering you face more than Christ. And I think that we would have a lot to learn to handle to meet and respond to the suffering in people around us just like Jesus. Not seeing their hurting and say, okay, now's my chance to give them some advice. Now's my chance to give them what they need to know. But rather, it's our chance to say nothing at all, just like Jesus did. He comforts them. He doesn't correct them. And I say to you on Christmas, in the Christmas season of 2019, you can make yourself like the sun compared to the darkness of everyone else in someone's life who's suffering this month. They are, are just like, they're, they're everywhere you turn. And they, all have, they will have never met someone like you if you are willing to not correct, not Uh, direct, but rather just listen, rather just be with them. This is what we will see here is the beginning of healing for all who are suffering. It's when you and I say nothing at all and we just walk with them. So look at what he says. I I think it's interesting to, to note that Jesus gives no correction, though certainly something could have been said. They were sinners, were they not? But the reason, in part, he says nothing, and I say that we ought to also say nothing to the hurting people in our lives, those who are afflicted in our lives in this season of life, is because sometimes the affliction that they're facing is because they have done well. And no one but God knows if the suffering that they are facing is merely because they have done well. Second Timothy 3 says, all who walk, uh, all who Seek to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. How do we know whether the affliction they're facing is because they weren't doing it the way we think they should have been doing it? When perhaps this is the suffering that comes with walking in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. So since God alone knows, it is good for us to be wise and not make it about ourselves Remember, there was this time uh, when Jesus gives a teaching about this prodigal son. I mean, this son had messed up so bad. He uh, spent all of his father's money. He had partied and partied so much that now he's broken. He has so little that he's watching pigs eat and thinking, I wish I could eat like those pigs I'm so hungry. The food I eat is worse than what those pigs are eating. And he's wishing he could have 
just even a morsel of goodness. He runs back home to his father. And the father is heartbroken for his son who had wasted so much time, so much money, so much of his life. And the big brother says, hey, you're throwing a party for him, but I've, what about me? I've been here all along. I've stayed with you, father. I didn't waste your money. I didn't go anywhere. What about me? Who are you in that picture? Some of us see people who are suffering. We're like, oh, wow, that person's so hurting. What about me? What about me? I, I haven't done those things. Lord, let's make this a pity party for me. Are you the prodigal or are you the, the brother who's turning someone's heartache and making it a chance to think about themselves? You, if you're anything like me, can have the tendency when we hear somebody who's suffering, think this is my chance to give them my two cents. This is my chance. They're going to have to listen. Look at all the mess in their life. Now they have to listen to me. Oh, good. This is about me. That's our tendency as, as people is to say, when people are hurting, let's give you some correction because you have to take it. Now look at you, your life's a mess. Your kids have done this, your life has done this, your wife has left you. Okay, good, now you got to listen. Is it true? Is it true that perhaps there's a better person they could be listening to than me or you? And sometimes the affliction that God has given or God has allowed is because he wants them to hear his voice and that means we got to shut up sometimes. And so Jesus is showing us that there's a time for us to say nothing at all. I remember that um, Job, remember it's like one of the earliest books of the Bible. I believe it was the first book written. Because for the very beginning, uh, we've been struggling with this. Job lost everything. He lost his kids. His wife has lost her faith in him. And he's lost all of his health. He's literally dying from the inside out. And then he has three faithful friends and they come and the Bible makes very good uh, point that they came and they said nothing, but they just sat next to him. They just, they were just with him. And then somewhere along the line, they decided that they were going to change their tactic and they begin to speak to him. And for the next 40 chapters, these friends who were comforting him in that they were just with him and saying nothing. Now they begin to tell him what they think he might have done wrong to make it so that he lost his kids, he lost his health, he lost his, the faith of his wife. And the Bible says at the very end, 40 chapters of these friends saying, well, Job, maybe you're a sinner. I guess this is because you're a sinner. And at the very end, Jesus, almighty God, speaks and says, everything your friend said was wrong. Just so, he, how much more clear can he be? And you and I often fall in the mistake of those friends when we begin to tell people what they need to, what we think they need to hear, rather than being quiet so they can listen to the voice that they really need to hear, which is Jesus, Almighty God. Jesus is the, he's called lots of names in the Bible. One of the references to Jesus, to God, is the comforter. And we think that that means that Jesus comes and speaks to us what we need to hear. But remember, the word comforter is literally this word paraclete. It means uh, to be alongside. So when the Bible says Jesus is our comforter or the Holy Spirit is our comforter, it's really saying, isn't it? He comes alongside us. The Bible teaches us that he is a very present help in times of trouble. He's with us. He's not telling us everything we did wrong necessarily, but he's with us. And that's where the comfort lies, and that's where it should stay. So as brothers or sisters, let us not make this mistake. I remember um, some years ago, Claire and I had a miscarriage. And we had had our first son, and um, he was a healthy baby boy, and <clears throat> we were very careful when we were pregnant with him to not tell the church that we were pregnant until I think it was the end of the first trimester. And we made that announcement. Micah was born and everything was great. Uh, we, had, we became pregnant uh, with our third child 
after Chloe, same thing, our second was born healthy. I, I started getting a little bit, um, I guess I got cocky. And the, we were about 10 weeks pregnant. And I told the church, oh, a foolisher thing, a more foolish thing I've, I don't know that I've ever done. Because we lost that child. And when that baby died, suddenly uh, what happens is when you tell people, when you show people that you're going through suffering, it gives people an opportunity to do something really, really well. But some people will also have an opportunity to really mess it up. <laughs> and if you've got a couple hundred people in your life, some of them are bound to mess this thing up, right? And especially Christians, because we hold Christians to a higher standard than we do non-Christians. So when non-Christians, do, uh, when Christians behave like the way they used to learn outside of Christ, uh, it hurts us more. And I remember, uh, you know, we were just, so my wife's no longer pregnant. That just becomes common knowledge. I mean, you, have to, you just tell people. And they begin to see that there's this suffering involved. And many of us as Christians handled it awesome. But, it, you know, it only takes a couple to really hurt. And uh, some of our, our dear Christian friends, your, your dear Christian friends, I don't know that uh, many of them are still here. But some, some of them came to us and came to me and said, Josh, how come you didn't text us? Josh, how come you didn't text a group of friends and let us pray for you? And I wanted to say, because I just didn't want to involve you. I just, I, we were just, but I, why should I have to explain myself? Why, why do we have to explain ourselves when we're suffering? I remember another person said, well, is this because you just don't value prayer? No, I value prayer. I, I, just, I just don't really want to involve you right now. Well, is this because you don't value us? This group of people said. No, it's not that I don't value you. I just value other things right now. I just... You know, when you're suffering, you don't really need to explain yourself, right? How come you didn't respond to my Facebook posts, this one person said. <laughs> what? I don't know. I don't. Somebody also said, well, how come when I text you that I'm praying for you, you don't respond? And at the time, I wasn't strong enough to say or even just realize that they're so weak that they don't, they're just so... They don't, they've never suffered. In the, or maybe they're just forgetting what it's like to suffer. They don't know. Don't, don't hold it against them. I struggled to hold it against them for a while. And there were so many of you, of course, who just were present. I'm, uh, I'm here for you, Josh. I'm here for you, Claire. Let us know what we can do to be a blessing to you. No expectations. No, uh, very many of, of us were able to just minister to a couple hurting. God bless you for that. You know, but I think that you and I need to always remember, are we making this about us when we see somebody who's suffering? Or are we just walking alongside them? So our challenge is, as brothers or sisters is to not try to steer anyone who's suffering, not try to direct them. By all means, do not guilt them. Just love them. So Jesus writes to this church in suffering and he gives no correction, no direction. He just gives encouragement. God bless him. And I think we have much to learn here. I want us to break down some of the things he says in his just building up the suffering people. May these be the same words that we say to the suffering people in our life in this very season. Let's read it again. He says in verse nine, I know your works and tribulation poverty but you are rich so he says to this church of smyrna so he calls them the church in smyrna because this church is marked by its great tribulation now there will be churches we'll find in of these seven churches each one has different trials and uh, different temptations Uh, there's a later on church that doesn't have persecution he says to it it's called laodicea we'll be there in a few weeks he says to the Laodiceans, he says, oh, you, you say you're rich. This is what Jesus says. You say you're rich, but you're miserable <laughs> and you're poor and naked and blind. <laughs> so the people who say they're rich are just the opposite. And then there's the people who are going through persecution, Christians who are going through tribulation. 
And he says, oh, you're so poor. Oh, but in parentheses, you are rich. And Jesus has a way of seeing things correctly. He sees what we need to see. That there are times when we have nothing at all, and that's when we have all that we need. Have you ever heard that great quote? The one who has God, the one who has God and everything else has no more than the one who has God alone. Now, do you feel that way? If you don't feel the way, that way, God has a way of teaching you that wonderful lesson by taking you away from everything else you have. And then you realize, I still have everything I once ever, that really mattered. Everything I ever really wanted, I still have because I have God alone. And the one who has God alone has as much as the one who has God alone or God and everything else. God will teach that to us because he loves us too much to not give us that lesson. So those, all who walk godly will suffer persecution because he just loves us too much to not let us learn that lesson. Have you ever been camping? Camping is a great opportunity because you have nothing. You, you don't have your cell phone service. You don't have your power. You've got a nice chest full of food. If you're lucky, the ice lasts till the next morning. You, just, you have like the simple food, right? And does that simple food not taste just as good as anything you had back at home? Sometimes better. Because there's something about having less that makes you appreciate what you still have all the more. So when you, you don't have the food, you don't have the, the comfortable bed, uh, you, you've got a, a simple seat if you're lucky, you might just have a log that you pulled up, suddenly you appreciate the friends you brought and you appreciate the night sky all the more. What really matters, now you really appreciate. And you wouldn't have had that if you had everything that you once did. Not only does it give you right priorities, it also gives you kind of a, a right heart towards others. Have you ever noticed that when you're off camping, or perhaps when you're on the mission field where you have very little, you find that there's radical generosity there? Certainly, I know uh, from my days as a younger man camping quite a bit, that if you ever needed anything, we just would go ask the campsite next to us, and they would always give it. And if ever anybody asked for anything, we'd give them what we needed. Why? Because we're just here for a weekend. This is just, we're going to go back home. It's just, who, I don't need that can opener back. You can have the flashlight. What, it, just, it doesn't matter. We've got an extra sleeping bag. In fact, you can stay in our camper. We'll sleep out here in the tent. We've got everything we need. It's just a little while we're here. We're going back home come Monday morning. And when you have very little, God shows you, actually, you can be very rich in Christ. Because you realize this place that I'm living right now, as suffering, and, and suffering might be part of that place you're living in, it's just a weekend. Your home is around the corner, and it's not far. If you are finding yourself making your home here, in this job, in your your home, literally your physical home, your health. God loves you too much to have you put your home in this place that's soon going to burn and just fall to pieces. So the Lord lovingly takes you to that place where you have less, very, very little health, finances, even family or friends, so that you realize I am rich and I can be generous because I can get to heaven, I will be in heaven, in just a moment, and it will be my forever home. So we learn through poverty what real riches are. He also says, um, did you read in verse 9? He says, I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Now, <clears throat> We understand that in Jesus' time, there were a lot of, after Jesus ascended uh, to heaven, that the apostles were sent out and, and people were getting saved left and right. And churches were being planted, in, uh, first and foremost, in the areas where there were Jews who were living. And so often, many of the, the first believers were Jewish by blood and by heritage. And they were all in the synagogue when they first heard the good news of Jesus Christ. 
And then rather than just meeting on Saturday, they would also meet on Sunday. So they'd go to synagogue on Saturday and then they'd go on Sunday to church and hear the gospel proclaimed. And they became to be Jews who believed in Jesus Christ. And all of the early church was made up of of, a strong Jewish component. And then in time, there will be more and more Gentiles, that is people who were not Jewish by blood, who were being saved. And, and in time, the Gentile believers of Jesus Christ outnumbered the Jewish believers in Jesus Christ. Second thing it's important for us to remember here, of course, is that in the Bible, um, it always speaks of Jews as people who are Jewish by blood. Without exception, the Bible is very clear that the Jews are those who are descendants of the 12 tribes of Israel. It's not, in, in modern times, you hear people call themselves a Jew, but they, what they mean is they're spiritual Jews. They, they aren't Jewish by blood or by ancestry, but they've kind of adopted the Jewish religious uh, rituals or the Jewish ceremonies. And though they be Gentiles, uh, naturally, they spiritually kind of associate with Jews. And I believe that's whom Jesus is speaking of. That's when he says you are a Jew, but you're not. You, there are people amongst you who say they're Jews, but they aren't. These are people who are not, uh, these are people who are not Jewish uh, ancestry or um, who came out of Jewish heritage. But now that they've come into the gospel, they're Gentiles. Now that they've come into the church, they've, they're meeting some believers who are of Jewish ancestry, and they say, I want to be a part of that. They're people who are being drawn to the ritual. They're being drawn to the ceremony and the rule keeping that was part of the Jewish uh, heritage. And Jesus is calling these people out for wanting to be, not just because they want to be part of the Jewish heritage, but because they want the rule keeping, they want the ritual keeping, the ceremonializing. In fact, in a lot of the epistles we've read um, in the New Testament, we find that Paul and Peter had to call out people who were returning to doing a lot of the law, doing the keeping of these ceremonies and eating certain things because of what God said in the Old Testament rather than what Jesus has done for us in the New Testament, setting us free from following rules. Instead, he wants us to follow him. So we don't follow rules for the sake of ritual. We follow Jesus Christ. And so there's, our moral system is based on what does Jesus do, not based on eating this or not eating that, wearing your hair like this or not wearing your hair like that, or wearing tussles and, or whatever it may be, sprinkle this or sprinkle that. No, we follow Jesus. And our, our, our law is the law of faith in Christ Jesus. We want to be like him in who he is. Not in the, the ceremonies and rituals, but we want to be like him for the decisions that he would make in our life. His morality becomes our morality. But the rituals of the Jews never should become, we must not be obligated to, to we must not feel an obligation to follow the rituals of the Jews. But I say all of this, I believe Jesus is saying this, that there are a people who are acting like they're Jews and they're not. And he actually calls that the gathering of them, the congregation, that's that word, the synagogue, is they're actually congregating and they're being congregated, they're being gathered by Satan, not by me, Jesus is saying. You see, this group of, in Smyrna, they were a church, a group of Christians who were suffering great persecution and tribulation. And there's lots of kinds of tribulation that we can face. Some of the tribulation we face is the, the hammer fall of uh, terrible government persecution. Sometimes it's uh, the persecution that comes from uh, employers and, not, and uh, uh, limiting what the employee can say or even believe. And then there's a whole other kind of persecution that comes from the family. When moms and dads say, you will be like this because we say so, rather than you will follow Jesus Christ because he says so. There's all kinds of persecution that we face. But there's a whole other persecution that Jesus is pointing out here. And sometimes it comes from fakes in the church. There are people who will always be in our churches who want to be something that they are not. And really they're being gathered in this thing, not by Jesus at all. 
but my Satan is coordinating it. Jesus wants us, excuse me, Satan wants some from us to be more focused on rituals and keeping the law and behaving in a certain way that outwardly that puts you in a group. Satan wants that. Jesus doesn't. Jesus wants us to be unified because of faith in Christ. Nothing else matters. And he knows that when we're following Jesus, we're going to behave like him. There will be love. There will be morality. There will be honesty and truth. He knows if we follow him, everything else will find its way where it needs to be. Satan wants us to be about groups and divisions, dissensions, and deceit. And sometimes we have to remember that the persecution we face from a government, from an employer, even from families, is also partnered with the persecution we face when brothers or sisters put a trip on us or they disagree with us and make that point of disagreement so important that that hurts just as much as the fires of tribulation. Anyone who's had a friend turn against them because of an argument over matters of of interpretation of these minor details, if anyone's been a part of a denominational breakdown, if anyone's been a part of when brothers left each other, Brothers in the faith left each other, not for Jesus, but for these little arguments that fester and and grow into infections. You know that that hurts just as much as beatings or loss of job. And I say all that because let us not think for a moment that only our brothers and sisters in China or Japan know what it is to have persecution. No, there is a persecution. For certainly, there are fake Christians. Or Christians even caught up in that lie. They're just caught up in going the wrong direction and putting a trip on other Christians, gossiping about other Christians, tearing other Christians down, and they don't even know that they're actually, that Satan's orchestrating it all. So let us be clear. We can, we, we, for you and I, let us not be those, who, we're not just not wanting to persecute people with a whip. We also don't want to persecute people with the tongue. And so let us all be very clear. Uh, We don't want to tear anybody down because that can be just as much of persecution and tribulation as as any government could do. So uh, so then verse 10, watch this, take a look. He says, and we're going to close with this. He says, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Does that seem callous to you? I mean, Jesus, don't you know I hurt? I miss that person who was taken from me. I miss that health that I used to have. Jesus, this hurts. Who are you to tell me do not suffer? Do not fear the things I'm about to suffer. It seems so hard. Until you remember, Jesus faced it first. There's absolutely nothing that you are going through that Jesus hasn't taken first. And so when he says, hey, don't fear, don't be afraid of what you, the suffering that is before you, he can say it because he can, he's been through it. And now he can say, it's all worth it. I can see that through the tribulation you're facing, something will be found that makes it all worth it. I want you to consider that you have a house. You love your house. But you and the kids are off on a weekend. And while you're gone, the house burns down. You, you come back and you find all your memory, all your phone, all, excuse me, all of your picture books and all your stuff, all your clothes, all your memorabilia, the stuff you got from grandma, everything's gone. It's just all ashes. And you're so heartbroken. You've lost it all. And yet, the next week, someone somehow figured out that actually underneath where your foundation was, there is, they found an oil geyser. They say, oh, you're now a billionaire. (laughs) You say, well, I didn't really need grandma's old wedding dress. I'm a billionaire. You are a billionaire. You really are. Actually, you got, you got uh, all that stuff that uh, Zuckerberg and Bill Gates and all those guys, nothing compared to what you have. You have to understand Billionaire is, that's nine zeros. They've got nothing on you. Because Jesus says there is a treasure in you 
that is worth everything? What if, if you have the whole world and lose your soul? Jesus says, what is it? And you and I have far more than a, a billion. We have, a, we, we have eternal life through Jesus Christ. And the only way we can know this treasure of faith that God has given us when Jesus, his son, died on the cross for us and he, he gave us the gift of faith, the only way you'll know what's buried in your heart is if something burns down. This is why, you've ever heard that phrase, you, you, you don't have a faith that can be trust, trusted until you have a faith that can be tested. So God lets things burn down in our life so that we can see, wow, the treasure that really matters is better than ever. And so when we lose that loved one, when we lose that health, when we lose that even decades of our life, we say, Lord, but if through all of these things I see that the gift of faith that you gave me years ago, now I see through the testing of fire that it's real. It is my ticket to eternal life. It's even my opportunity to share that life with everyone and anyone now. Suddenly that tribulation became a blessing. Jesus says here in this passage that, uh, he says in verse 10, be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. You know, you, you can have, uh, there's so many things that you, you might think I need to do. I've got to tell people about Jesus. And that's a good thing. You should. Please do. But, you know, you telling people about Jesus is not the only way you can get treasure in heaven or a, a crown of life. For some of us, even what we are going through right now, you and I going through heartbreak, and holding on to our faith can give as much eternal treasure in heaven forevermore as anything else. Oh, there's Billy Graham. He's off in the stadium somewhere. God bless him. He's now in heaven wearing a couple crowns, I suppose. And all those people who supported that ministry and prayed for him. And oh man, they're, they're in heaven with their crown. But you and I also, refusing to give up on Jesus when we look at the house burned down? You and I refusing, like he says, being faithful until death. You and I refusing to let go of that faith, even in the loss of a child, a, a sick grandson, granddaughter. Refusing to let go of the faith when doubts come, when questions arise, when someone seems to be doing better than us and yet we say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to hold on to faith. Jesus says, if you will just be faithful till the end, for you there is a crown of life. 